Welcome to Natu Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. From a native daughter, Colonialism and Sovereignty in Hawaii, by Honanike Trask. Part 4. Native Hawaiians and a White University. Racism against Native Hawaiians at the University of Hawaii, a personal and political view. The Colonial Context. Since the 18th century arrival of Westerners in my native land, Hawaii has been much vaunted as a, quote, paradise, end quote, of sunny beaches, lush, unspoiled valleys, erupting volcanoes, and happy natives. Thanks to Hollywood movies and tourist industry propaganda, this paradisal myth endures. To the West, and increasingly to Japan, Hawaii represents a Pacific playground for escape or romance or recreation. It is a fantasy, a state of mind. But for Hawaiians, this image is nothing but the usual colonial propaganda. And it is only in a context of colonialism that formal education in Hawaii can be understood. Indeed, public education in Hawaii is similar in purpose to Francophone education in French-controlled Tahiti and English education in Commonwealth New Zealand. The University of Hawaii stands atop the educational pyramid of public schools as the flagship campus for the state. With over 40,000 full and part-time students, it is a living symbol of colonization. In many ways, the university is an educational equivalent to the American Military Command Center in Hawaii. Both serve as guardians of white dominance, both support the state economy, and both provide a training ground for future technocrats. Just as universities and other colonies function to legitimate and entrench the power of the colonizing culture, so the University of Hawaii functions to maintain haole, white, American control. The standard American university curriculum, bureaucratic structure, and white male-dominated faculty characterize the institution. In addition, there is a School of Travel Industry Management, a Chair of Free Enterprise, renamed the Walker Chair to avoid the crassness of the original title, and a Hawaii real estate center, which support the local tourist industry. An affiliated East-West Center, a creature of the federal government, was established as a counterinsurgency think tank during the Vietnam War, and continues as a gathering place for military, government, and corporate interests focused on Asia and the Pacific Basin. All this exists on a tiny Polynesian island that is part of the most isolated archipelago in the world. It also exists on the ancestral land base of the Hawaiian people. As a haole enclave in a local society where Asians are the largest numerical group and whites and Hawaiians are each about a fifth of the one million residents in Hawaii, the university is a 19th century throwback to the first stages of white colonialism. People of color comprise more than 75% of the student body, while the faculty is more than 75% white. Along with the sugar companies and the banks, the university is one of the few remaining institutions where no attempts have been made to add a little native color to the visible white reality. In 1981, I entered this bastion of white power as an assistant professor of American studies. I was an active member and occasional spokesperson for various struggles in the Hawaiian movement. And I had recently completed a doctoral dissertation on feminist theory at the University of Wisconsin. Like dozens of other Hawaiians who had been sent to the metropole to become assimilated professionals, I had returned to Colony Hawaii as a native nationalist. My growing public persona was that of an indigenous critic of American imperialism in Hawaii. And although I was identified by the Haole press as one of the more militant activists in the movement, nothing I did or said was beyond the bounds of critical public dissent. But in a colony, any dissent is threatening, especially by natives. My application and hiring unleashed forces of racism and political suppression in the department that lasted until I was transferred to another academic unit, as part of a settlement of a racism-sexism grievance, in the fall of 1986. 
between my hire and transfer, I lived through a five-year battle, with student community support, against all manner of oppressive and exploitative conditions. Racism by individual faculty and by the institution as a whole, attempts to prevent my written and verbal expressions of my critical, political views, violation of the academic freedom to teach certain subjects and ideas, and petty daily harassment on the job. At times, even the recognition of my humanity as a Hawaiian was at issue. But, with the help of supporters, including my faculty union, I prevailed. The struggle consumed over five years of my life, and yet, like most victorious resistance efforts, it was, in the end, a victory for more than myself. The ultimate success of one Hawaiian woman who fought the Haole world and won is a tale worth recounting. Racism and Suppression of Political Views The Scene The strange origins of an American Studies Department in Colony Hawaii deserve some background. Evolving out of the federal government's East-West Center in the early 60s, the department had been chaired by the same man for nearly 20 years when I applied for my job. By his own proud admission, he had worked for the Central Intelligence Agency prior to his appointment at the East-West Center and the university. He was also well known as an adversary of the small liberal community on campus and had been known to make disparaging remarks about oppositional people of color, including Hawaiians. As chair, he had hired the early members of the department, including two of his former students. Structurally, he had enormous power, with only weak advisory committees beneath him. As a result, his long tenure as chair had created a docile faculty too willing to be governed and too meek to demand a change in leadership. By 1981, the department had nine full-time male faculty, one half-time female faculty, and two emeritus male faculty. Two of their number were Asian, the rest were white. None were Hawaiian. Academically, only a third of the faculty had acceptable publishing records, including books. The remainder had published with vanity presses or, like the chair, had published only a few articles or nothing at all. In ideological terms, the department represented a very, quote, celebrate America, end quote, pro-capitalist, pro-empire perspective. The black civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and the women's movement did not appear in the teaching of most faculty. Intellectually, the faculty were, and still are, in a pre-60s mode. Indeed, there was no third world or Marxist analysis of America at all. And there was surely no attention paid to the Hawaiian movement or to the military tourist exploitation of Hawaii because of its colonial status. The Hawaiian people, beyond our tourist manifestations, were completely unknown to the faculty, just as Maori communities in New Zealand would be unknown to English professors at the University of Auckland. Finally, the characteristic isolation of academics from the surrounding community was compounded by the racism of a faculty who felt superior to the general public, including students, because they were so overwhelmingly Asians or Hawaiians, or, as Americans are fond of repeating, quote, non-white, end quote. Culturally, this superiority showed its hand in a number of ways. Disparaging remarks were often made by faculty about pigeon-speaking local students who could not, rather than would not, speak what the faculty called, quote, standard English, end quote. The lack of knowledge about American cultural institutions, such as the New York Times or championship baseball teams, on the part of students, irritated faculty who bemoaned the, quote, provincialism, end quote, of life in Hawaii. Indeed, one adjunct faculty wrote an entire book about this, quote, provincialism, end quote, which, predictably, was published by a vanity press and wound up as required reading in his courses. Local cultural traits, for example, ethnic humor or habits of local dress, were ridiculed by many faculty as backcountry buffoonery. And Hawaiian culture, when noticed at all, was relegated to the entertainment, recreational category of an occasional hula, dance, festival, or commercial luau, feast. In reality, 
most of the American Studies faculty behaved like colonial settlers on the outskirts of empire, enduring their postings until a better opportunity came along. Act 1. In the Land of the White Man By February of 1981, I had applied for a position in American Studies that called for expertise in women's studies and in a cross-cultural field. In my case, Hawaii and the Pacific. Some 51 other candidates had applied, and the Department Personnel Committee had chosen six semifinalists, myself included. On February 23rd, the department selected their top two choices. One white female candidate about to complete a PhD in American Studies at an Ivy League university, and myself, about to complete a PhD in Political Science from the University of Wisconsin. The meeting was very long, a total of six hours divided into afternoon and evening sessions, and contentious. My politics were openly discussed, and one faculty member, who was Asian, asserted that my hire would be inappropriate because I was, quote, radical, end quote. This was only the first salvo. The field had been narrowed, but my hire was yet to come. Sometime in late February, the chair removed several pages listing community service from my vita, which had been placed on file for departmental perusal. When discovered by one of my faculty supporters, the chair said he meant only to quote balance and quote the vitae, since the other candidate did not have a list of community activities. The other finalist, meanwhile, was flown in from the American continent for interview and public lecture. She stayed at the chair's house, where he also arranged for reception in her honor. As a Hawaiian candidate, and an activist one at that, no such amenities were extended to me. By the middle of March, when both candidates were being interviewed, relations between some of my faculty supporters and the chair had deteriorated. To fulfill the requirements of due process and steer clear of administrative oversight, some faculty insisted that I should also be hosted at a reception. A hastily arranged one was held at a faculty member's house, but by this time any quote routine and quote interview process was beyond salvage. It was clear, at least to me, that I was treading on whites-only territory. Despite the presence of two Asians of the department, both of whom self-identified as assimilationist and spoke openly against my hire because I was an activist, my presence was perceived, at least by the chair, as a Hawaiian encroachment. On March 20th, the faculty voted. According to my supporters, the meeting was filled with such argument and accusation regarding my, quote, radicalism, end quote, on behalf of Hawaiians that everyone felt exhausted in the end. After an initial tie vote, I was selected on the second ballot, which visibly upset the chair. Later, he would tell other faculty that they had betrayed him by voting for a, quote, troublemaker, end quote. As in the past, the faculty assumed he would follow established procedures and offer the job to the chosen candidate that is, to me. Instead, he called the other finalist, said the faculty was hopelessly, quote, split, end quote, and the position, quote, frozen, end quote. I, of course, never heard from him. Two weeks of silence elapsed before I called the personnel committee chair to tell him I'd heard nothing. He was flabbergasted. As a white, Yale-educated male faculty member, he had nothing in his personal experience to prepare him for the chair's overt and boastful racism. While we spoke, I noted that the department chair might withdraw the position rather than follow the faculty mandate to hire me, a suggestion that elicited laughter and a reply that I was, quote, paranoid, end quote. On April 10th, at a faculty meeting called by the chair, he read a prepared statement. The following is a direct quotation from the chronology of events kept by the personnel committee. Quote, the chair said he believed the university and the department were not democracies, that they were rather, quote, authoritarian and paternalistic, end quote, in fact. He went on to state that the provost, the chancellor, and the president of the university had all been approached by him and they had agreed to block Trask's appointment. Consequently, 
No one was to be hired for the slot, which had been empty for several years. Not a single faculty member spoke in support of the chair's actions. The response, on the contrary, was at first shock over the violating of department collegiality, openness, and agreed-upon procedures, and then a unanimous request that the chair reconsider his stand, end quote. Faculty supporters later told me the chair said I was, quote, unqualified, end quote, for the job, but gave no reasons why he thought so. The day after this debacle, I gathered together a group of student and community supporters and resource people, attorneys, researchers, photographers, to strategize our position. Given the faculty's vote, and thus their confidence in my credentials, and given the historic antagonism between whites and Hawaiians, it was clear to us that the chair's actions were racist. Of course, the American Studies faculty would continue to deny that racism was involved at all, choosing instead to dig up the familiar academic smokescreen of lack of, quote, collegiality, end quote, by the chair. As Hawaiians, however, our experience told another story. All the obvious signs of racism were present in the chair's behavior. Fear at my application, nervousness at my presence, procedural, quote, irregularities, end quote, during the interview process, vociferous denial of racist behavior, and finally, outright rejection of my hire. But the worst was yet to come. On April 16th, the chair called another meeting with me and four faculty who supported me. When the meeting began, there was a menacing strangeness in the air. As we took our seats, the chair turned off all the lights, and in the unannounced and eerily threatening dark, he began a slideshow. His narrating voice, tight with anger, seeped out of the projection booth. One by one, horrifying slides of Nazi victims at Buchenwald hit the screen. After a few minutes, the chair began making references to his heritage as a Jew which, he heatedly insisted, made it impossible for him to be a racist. No one, to my knowledge, had accused him of racism, nor did he say anyone had. I felt him to be on the jagged edge of insanity. When the slides were finished, none of the faculty spoke. I began to wonder why I had ever wanted a job in such a crazy department. The chair came to the table in a trembling fury, saying, to our complete surprise, he would hire me. He had failed, he went on, to secure a part-time, non-tenured track position he called a, quote, compromise, end quote. Thus, he was forced to offer the original position for which I had interviewed. Various faculty tried, in a timid and roundabout way, to tell him that his behavior was, quote, inappropriate, end quote, and that I was being unjustly treated. One professor, who was also Jewish, pleaded with him about his attitudes regarding Hawaiians, intimating that his reference to the Jewish Holocaust was both strange and irrelevant. None of the faculty mentioned the slideshow directly, pretending they had not seen it. Neither did anyone express anger at the chair's intimidation in the meeting. The sense of the faculty seemed to be that he was still the chair and deserved their deference no matter how obscenely he behaved. I had been spoken about in the third person for 20 minutes with not a single verbal acknowledgement of my presence in the room. Although all faculty invited by the chair had voted for me, none felt any obligation to speak to me directly. The scene moved toward the bazaar. Not knowing what else to do or say, and feeling both humiliated and very angry, I asked for an opportunity to speak, which was granted almost gladly by the faculty. Of course, the chair still refused to recognize me. I recited the recent events that brought us to the present, reminding everyone, especially the chair, that I had survived a national search. I noted that the other finalist, who was Haole, would never have been mistreated if she had been selected. To me, this was evidence enough that I was suffering discrimination because of my race and my politics. The chair's earlier comment that I was, quote, unqualified, end quote, only underscored my point. I concluded by saying a letter of intent to hire should be drawn up immediately. The faculty eagerly agreed. They understood events were out of control, 
but were reluctant, even nervous, about moving ahead. They appeared incredibly cowed. To me, they seemed terrified. Naturally, the chair refused to give me a letter. A few days later, after he let it be known to several faculty that he was reconsidering his announced decision to offer me the position, the personnel committee met with him, said they would not support his continuing refusal, and communicated as much to the chancellor. Several meetings ensued between the faculty and the administration, in which the faculty continued to argue violations of procedures and, quote, collegiality, end quote, by the chair. Eventually, the chancellor was asked by the faculty for a change in chairmanship and for permission to hire me. Nothing happened. Quote, racism, end quote, was never uttered by any of the faculty. Privately, some faculty told me they found events inexplicable, and when I proffered racism as an explanation, they became silent. I felt their world locked in everlasting refusal. Our committee proceeded to assemble representatives from a half dozen Hawaiian communities, from departments across the campus, and from student organizations. A meeting was planned between department representatives and our group. In many ways, the encounter was a good illustration of the tensions between whites and Hawaiians in the colony. Although the behavior of our committee members was respectful, the department's two representatives, both white men, were visibly frightened by the physical presence of so many Hawaiians. The chair of my support group, also a white man and a faculty member from another department, presented our demand that I be hired as soon as possible. The rest of the committee expressed the general concern that I was being treated badly because I was Hawaiian and that various Hawaiian communities, once the word was out, would look very unfavorably on the situation. Our support committee had decided it was absolutely crucial for the department to understand the situation. Accustomed to secrecy, they were being told that public exposure was imminent if I was not hired. In the long run, this constant threat of exposure kept the faculty moving toward a resolution. By the end of April, there was a new acting chair. The previous one had finally been forced to resign. I was in the last stages of completing the dissertation, and my support committee was still planning strategy in the event that a letter was not tendered to me. May and June were hectic. Department instability continued because the acting chair was to leave soon for a foreign country, and another chair would need to be appointed. I was offered the job and, of course, accepted. But I began to be seen, in the subtlest ways, as the source of embarrassment, much in the way rape victims are seen because they have brought shame to families or communities. In addition, my high visibility as a spokesperson for Hawaiian rights continued to be discussed in various faculty meetings as already disruptive to the department, given my problematic hire. My critical stance on the United States as an imperialist power in Hawaii and around the world was seen as potentially dangerous if students were affected by my ideas. Slowly, my faculty supporters began to feel, uncomfortably, in the minority. In July, Four months after the faculty had voted for me, I defended my dissertation at Wisconsin and became an assistant professor of American Studies at the University of Hawaii. The struggle to get me hired was over, but undercurrents of bitterness remained only to resurface later. Act 2 In the Land of the White Woman Between the fall of 1981 and the fall of 1984, the chair of the department was a white woman. At first, I felt relief at having a new chair, especially one who had voted for me. A month into her appointment, however, I began to sense that nothing had changed. Intellectual, political, even stylistic differences became the source of heated conflict between us. Her belief that there existed a correct way, a culturally correct way, of speaking and behaving made it clear to me how white hegemony in Hawaii and on the campus would mean a tight constraint on my cultural behaviors. I was to start acting, as we say in Hawaiian, as a ho'ohale, someone who behaves like a white person. 
I was shocked, bemused, furious, and depressed. Very depressed. I was told, for example, what to teach and what not to teach. In my required reading of an introductory course on American society, I had included sections on racism and capitalism as basic American institutions and ideologies. The chair pressured me to remove those sections and supplant them with units on the family in Christianity. I refused, but the disagreement left a bitter feeling between us. Regarding faculty meetings, the chair tried to tell me what to say and what not to say, even how I should speak. After one faculty meeting, she took me aside to say that I should, quote, treat the faculty appropriately, end quote. Given that I had disagreed with several senior faculty about their treatment of Asian foreign students, which I considered discriminatory, it was clear that she meant I was not to argue or challenge other faculty, especially as I was a junior member of the department. Of course, such constant directions to me resulted in constant fighting, as I very much resented being patronized. During one of these arguments, the chair suggested I ought to be, quote, grateful, end quote, to the faculty for hiring me. This kind of liberal paternalism infuriated me, for obvious reasons. It implied that I was not the most qualified person for the job, despite surviving a national search. It also meant that I was somehow to be her apprentice, that is, to occupy the inferior place white racists habitually reserve for their, quote, dark, end quote, friends. Part of the status was evident on one occasion when I was introduced to some visiting faculty as, quote, our little Hawaiian, end quote. Of course, it had never entered my mind to introduce the chair to visiting Hawaiians as, quote, our little haole, end quote. Beyond these very telling incidents were larger controversies about my political analysis of historical events. The best case involved student complaints, all by Haole students, about statements I made regarding genocide against American Indians as comparable to Nazi genocide against Jews. Using the complaints as an excuse, the chair tried to have me formally censured by the department. Despite support from my students disputing what the first set of students, who were not registered in my class, had alleged, the chair asked the personnel committee to censure me. I was not asked for my version of what had taken place. Moreover, the chair argued that by entering a formal complaint in my personnel file, evidence would be available later when I came up for tenure consideration. Finally, our faculty union was consulted at my insistence. They told the committee, in writing, that neither the chair nor the committee had the power of censure, which was held by the administration. They also urged that a more informal settling of disagreements be attempted. All except one member of the personnel committee supported the chair in her censuring effort. When they finally agreed to meet with me, the assumption was that I was guilty of unprofessional conduct and deserved a reprimand. Neither the supporting evidence of my students nor my own explanations were allowed into the discussion. Predictably, we never broached the subject of whether Americans had committed genocide against Indians, nor whether Hitler had used the example of U.S. treatment of Indians in his planning of the extermination of the Jews, which I had said and which the students had complained about. To me, this case in particular seems so egregiously a violation of every tenet of university life. The right to teach certain analyses, the right to defend what is taught, the right to confront and wrangle over disagreement, the right to be free of harassment because of what is taught. And yet, such are the contours of racism, of the disgusting detail upon which the small freedom to teach a critical perspective is made to depend. Finally, the chair had said that university rules prohibited me from teaching graduate courses, a requirement for tenure, until I was formally made a member of the graduate faculty. At the time, I accepted the statement as fact, but later it would prove to be false and thus part of my grievance argument that I had suffered discrimination. By 1984 and the change in chairs, my relationship with the department was strained almost beyond repair. I had increased my public criticism of the treatment of Hawaiians, the failure of the state of Hawaii to enforce our native trusts and place Hawaiians under the land, the historic and contemporary power of white people in Hawaii, and of the exploitative, prostituting effects of mass-based corporate tourism. 
I had criticized America and the state of Hawaii in two national magazines, one national radio show, and in a BBC film about the Pacific. I had also traveled to the United Nations in Geneva to testify about America's overthrow of our government, illegal annexation of our islands, and continued abuse of our trust lands. This testimony was subsequently published in one of our local dailies. Every occasion on which I made a public lecture or speech that was covered in the local press, or worse, in the national or international press, created a flurry of discussion about the damaging reputation, that is, the reputation of a critical voice in a status profession, I was giving the department. As one letter writer to the local newspaper put it, there seemed to be a, quote, Department of Un-American Studies at the university, end quote. None of this is meant to convey some extraordinary level of activism on my part. In fact, there were other Hawaiians more publicly active, but they were not on the faculty. And that, more than anything, was the crucial line I had crossed. I was a public person in a little colonial university where public dissent, especially on the side of natives, is perceived as outrageous and threatening. Hawaii is not California, nor even Wisconsin. We have no, quote, liberal, end quote, wing in our state government, and certainly not in the university. There are no critical news stations or radical magazines in Hawaii, and there is definitely no unified opposition. In short, there is widespread censorship, some of it self-induced, most of it institutionally enforced. Thus, my kind of public criticism habitually results in the extreme overreactions on the part of the state government, the tourist industry, and American chauvinists, like American Studies faculty, in the islands. Because there is so little dissent, there is no tolerance of what little there is. Act 3. The Pitched Battle The next chair had been a member of the personnel committee that had tried to censure me. I had no doubts about the nature of his feelings or the style of his chairmanship. Like his predecessors, he was authoritarian, elitist, occasionally racist, and always hostile to any changes I suggested or privileges I desired. The deterioration of working conditions made me rethink my whole strategy. Up until 1985, I had been operating defensively. Every little struggle began with my reaction to some policy on the part of the chairs. Despite worsening relations and increasingly damaging yearly evaluations, I kept performing in the hope that my record of scholarship, teaching, and service, if excellent, would force the faculty to vote for tenure. But a combination of factors shifted me into an offensive strategy. The first was the constant reference in discussions with the chairs and in my yearly evaluations to my, quote, straining collegiality, end quote, in the department. Since, quote, collegiality, end quote, was a requirement for tenure, a requirement, by the way, that had been added to departmental criteria only after I was hired, I sensed that, quote, collegiality, end quote, would be the reason given for my eventual firing. The second factor was the impossible trap of being required to teach a graduate course for tenure consideration at the same time the chairs denied me an opportunity to do so. Finally, when the department hired a white male assistant professor with a brand new PhD and no publications or teaching experience and gave him a graduate course in his first year, I filed a sex and race discrimination grievance with our union. Before the filing, I tried one last time to talk to the chair into allowing me to teach a required graduate course in my field. His answer, without explanation, was no. The grievance forced the battle into the jarring light of public scrutiny. It took over a year and a half to come to completion during which time my relations with the past two chairs collapsed into near war. Since they were both named in the grievance, they both felt under attack. I alleged that I had been deceived, discriminated against, and obstructed in my professional duties, for example, teaching a graduate course, because of my race, my politics, and my gender. Because I was very critical of the United States, 
And because I was Hawaiian, I was being denied what non-critical white men, some of whom were less published than I, were being allowed as a matter of course. The whole episode smelled of white male privilege. Our faculty union supported my efforts and greatly strengthened my arguments. Their presence forced the conflict out of an individual arena into an institutional one. The chairs now had to respond, even if perfunctorily, to an interested party outside the department. As the grievance made its way through layers of administrative bureaucracy, it was interesting to analyze the responses. At the first two stages, the administration, in the person of a hearing officer, found for the department. This was not surprising, given that chairs are considered to be representatives of the administration and the departments. The basic finding had been that denying me a graduate course was a chair's managerial prerogative. On this reasoning, anyone could be denied all sorts of rights of employment. The principle of, quote, fair rules fairly applied, end quote, would never make headway when chairs had such power. At the third stage of the grievance, however, things began to change. The issue went to the Union Grievance Committee and then to the full Union Board for a vote. This stage was crucial because my perceptions and arguments would be examined by other, non-involved faculty. If the Grievance Committee recommended to the Board, which subsequently voted to seek arbitration, then my peers saw merit in the case. Although this was not a judgment of the issue, it did give me an enormous boost of confidence when the union moved quickly to the arbitration stage. While both chairs had an opportunity to respond to my charges of sex and race discrimination at the first two stages of the grievance, they took a nonchalant attitude to the entire process. But when the union voted favorably, they began to harass board members bantering them by phone about the alleged unfairness of the grievance committee procedures. Although the female chair had never complained about the procedures when she was on the union board, she found them suddenly biased. Finally, a long letter from both chairs to the union president emphasized that if my allegations were found to have merit by an outside arbitrator, the university could be in violation of federal civil rights laws. The chair's letter was intended to frighten the board possibly even to force them to retract their support of my grievance. But it had the opposite effect. Board members were shocked at the crude efforts to influence them. Eventually, the union president directed them to maintain confidentiality. For me, the chair's letter gave proof to my argument that every attempt I had made to discuss my situation resulted in being treated even more like a pariah. The union board was now being harassed, as I had been, and they did not like it. Unwittingly, the chairs illustrated the very conduct I had deplored. By the time the university, the union, and I had agreed to an arbitrator, a change in personnel in the upper reaches of the administration had occurred. Drawn from the faculty, these new people dealt with grievances in a less adversarial manner seeking negotiation rather than arbitration. Again, the public nature of arbitration gave the university pause. For the sake of image and for the well-being of faculty administration relationships, in-house resolutions of conflict were preferred. After three months of serious discussion, a satisfactory agreement was achieved. I was transferred to the Hawaiian Studies program and became the first full-time faculty member there. Given that I had been working with faculty across the campus on a Hawaiian Studies task force and had published in that area as well, it was a near-perfect choice. For me, no other move could have been better. My position was also transferred, which infuriated the powers at American Studies. Since they were scheduled for a gradual loss of four positions through retirement, however, my unexpected departure actually helped them. They also did not have to worry about losing a grievance on sex and race discrimination. I had won, but I had also spent nearly five years under terrible employment conditions because I was both a Hawaiian nationalist and a critic of the United States. No victory, no matter how sweet, could repay those lost five years. 
Conclusions Simple Truths and Strategies I applied for tenure in Hawaiian Studies in the fall of 1986. With a book, seven articles, and a good teaching record, I felt able to withstand scrutiny from anyone. An ad hoc committee unanimously recommended for tenure and promotion, which was granted by the Board of Regents in July of 1987. As I look back on my long struggle, some basic truths emerge. The most important truth, I think, is that institutional racism and sexism cannot be fought alone. In my case, lack of tenure, indigenous status, and female gender placed me in a profoundly powerless situation. My politics exacerbated what, in any white department, would have been a disadvantaged position at the start. But a determined public posture as a native nationalist in a colony guarantees repression. In this situation, it is a truism that the more besieged the activist, the greater the need for support. A coalition of supporters must be formed for daily strategizing and as a core to organize a larger community group. For faculty who have attentive publics, like feminists, environmentalists, and African-American, Asian, Chicano, and Native activists, this organizing effort will prove crucial when negotiations finally occur. And the group will remind both victim and institution that the politics of the issue encompass more than just the person involved. In terms of strategy, the struggle must not bog down on individual players. For example, all three chairs in American studies were discriminatory, but the first chair acted in such a freakish manner that it seemed for a while the problem was his alone. The behavior of the chairs over the next four and a half years proved this wrong. But even if it were otherwise, the tendency to see events as individual acts must be countered by a smart political sense that tells us as people of color when institutional racism is operating. Political analysis must always be primary when formulating strategy. Tactically, public exposure is the best weapon in fighting an institution whose actions depend on secrecy. In Hawaii, the myth of racial harmony, indeed, of a veritable racial paradise, has so thoroughly obscured the existence of racism against Native Hawaiians that any charge of such is considered false on its face. Beyond our specific problems, universities in general are nervous about racism because they purport to uphold principles long since negated by the rest of the business world. It is always wise to hold the university to its professed ideals, because the potential for embarrassment is large. Other tactical lessons are less central, but good to know, such as the fact that liberal supporters, who have no professed ideology or analysis, and are just, quote, nice people, end quote, will be duly shocked by racism and will offer private expressions of sympathy, but will refuse to join a support committee. They suffer from the fear of public activity that afflicts so many academics. Of course, in my case, such people had nothing to lose, while most of the Hawaiians who supported me had much to lose, a day's pay or other difficulties with work or even families, but felt the injustice so keenly that they were willing to take some risks. Professors, especially white men, were generally unwilling to take risks. In addition, a few supporters were able to go part of the way, but gave up at a certain point, because the struggle dragged on and on. This kind of attrition is predictable, but must not be allowed to affect the issues or the strategies. Still, more than any other obstacle, this depleting of forces depresses the group. In my case, the union filled a big gap here because their staff were both paid and emotionally distant. And as far as unions go, it is my absolute belief that people of color need unions, even mediocre ones, because having some institutional voice is better than having no institutional voice. The quote, white male boys club, end quote, is for white males, and on occasion for compliant white females but it is no protection for activist faculty of color. 
The most obvious conclusion is that racism and sexism are the evil within. Nothing, not the 60s, not third world wars of liberation, not a minuscule middle class of people of color, has changed any of that. Everywhere in the academy, racism and sexism and a host of other oppressive creatures are festering and growing. While speaking out on controversial issues is apparently protected at universities, there are countless stories of denied tenure that tell a different truth. Thus, the struggle for faculty of color, who are also activists, includes free speech, not only academic freedom. In my case, references to the confusion between my roles as quote, citizen, end quote, and quote, professor, end quote, appeared in my yearly job renewals as causes of collegial quote, strain, end quote. I had replied that no distinction exists between the categories. The chair, however, argued that political speech by a professor is inappropriate in the public realm. Of course, they meant critical political speech. Professors who supported the status quo never had the problems I did. Given that political speech is absolutely protected speech, it is not difficult to see why the chairs attempted such stupid distinctions. This denial to faculty of the role of, quote, public intellectuals, end quote, is one of the most serious abridgments now taking place in universities. Of all the institutions in society, the university is the one that has an obligation to analyze, criticize, and provoke in the public realm. Without this, the role of, quote, public intellectual, end quote, will be filled by gadflies, entrepreneurs, or publicity hounds and the function of public criticism will pass from the university altogether. This brings me to my last point, which is, as well, a beginning. Resistance. More than verbal disagreement, resistance takes organization, planning, and a tenacity that develops and sustains individual and group capacities. For women of color, especially those who are very public in their positions as intellectuals and as activists, there is no other alternative but vigilance and struggle. Without it, institutions wear us down by petty bureaucratic procedures and the force of inertia. As someone who has persevered over the years, I can truthfully say that resistance is its own reward. The Politics of Academic Freedom as the politics of white racism. In 1990 and 1991, a huge controversy erupted in Hawaii over my letter to a student newspaper chiding a white male student for complaining about our word for white people, haole. The details of the controversy are clear in this speech, which was delivered at a panel on academic freedom called by the Peace Institute of the University of Hawaii campus. Eventually, the Institute published an entire book on the controversy. But what is most amazing is the worldwide coverage of the effort by the university to sanction me for my written speech. Articles appeared in various newspapers on the American continent, including the Los Angeles Times and the New York Times, in Europe and Japan, Australia and New Zealand, and even in places such as Sri Lanka and India. My own opinion about this coverage is that Hawaii's global reputation as a, quote, paradise, end quote, of racial relations made my statement shocking. After all, lots of natives tell white Americans where to go, but not in Hawaii. Tonight, I'm going to relate a story that begins with the genocide of a native people and ends with an attempt to silence one of their survivors and fiercest defenders. It is a story of white cultural and economic imperialism in its broadest outlines, and of white hegemony and white racism on this campus. Specifically, it is a story of the politics of academic freedom as the politics of white racism. For Hawaiians, American colonialism has been a violent process. The violence of mass death, the violence of American missionizing, the violence of cultural destruction, the violence of the American military. Once the United States annexed my homeland, a new kind of violence took root. The violence of educational colonialism, 
where foreign holiday values replace native Hawaiian values. Where schools, such as the University of Hawaii, ridicule Hawaiian culture and praise American culture. And where white men assume the mantle of authority, deciding what is taught, who can teach, even what can be said, written, and published. In Colony Hawaii, the University of Hawaii stands atop the educational pyramid of the state. Like the military, the university is a guardian of white cultural dominance. The standard American university curriculum, bureaucratic structure, and white male faculty characterize the institution. People of color comprise over 75% of the student body, while the faculty is over 75% haole. For Hawaiians, the situation is even worse. 13 tenured Hawaiian faculty compared with nearly 660 white faculty. This situation constitutes institutional racism, the institutional dominance of white people over people of color. Enter into this white male university a white male student named Joey Carter, lately come from the American South, where whites are not only dominant, but where white supremacist organizations are on the rise. Complaining in a public letter to the student paper, Kaleo, Carter mistakenly says that words like, quote, Haole dominated, end quote, society, and, quote, puppet Haole governments, end quote, are racist. That, quote, Haole, end quote, is like the word, quote, N word, end quote, that white repression, persecution, and domination of non whites is, quote, supposed, end quote, as opposed to actual. That he was chased and beaten by locals because of his skin and eye color, and finally ending his complaint by asserting that people are individuals as opposed to members of historical groups who, quote, classify, end quote, themselves as they like. Clearly, Mr. Carter was feeling uncomfortable in Hawaii, where white people do not have the usual majority status, nor the unquestioned ability to categorize others as they do on the American continent. Quickly following this letter came dozens of replies in Kaleo, including my own, in which Carter was instructed about his place, history, and role in Hawaii. Educating Carter about the history of white Americans, I explained that, quote, haole, end quote, is in fact one of the few surviving Hawaiian language descriptions in common use in Hawaii. I went on to say that Carter's appeal to, quote, individual, end quote, exemption from the power and privilege of white hegemony is itself a typical American ploy to avoid responsibility for an ugly and vicious history that visited genocide on American Indians, slavery on Africans, peonage on Asians, and dispossession of both lands and self-government on Native Hawaiians. I informed Carter that he is a direct beneficiary, as are all white people, of racism, of a system of power in which one racially identified group dominates and exploits another racially identified group for the benefit of the exploiting group. In the United States, people of color do not have the power to practice racism against white people. The same is true in Hawaii, particularly in regard to Native Hawaiians who, in contrary to Carter's beliefs, are not free to classify themselves, but are legally classified under American law by blood quantum. Hawaiians of 50% blood quantum are Native, those with less blood quantum are not Native. Finally, I argued that the hatred and fear people of color have of white people is born of experience, the experience of white violence. Therefore, it is for self-protection and in self-defense that people of color feel hostility toward the haole. This hostility, I went on, is not, quote, haole bashing, end quote, but a smart political sense of survival. There is no reason why people who have suffered genocide and land dispossession and who continue to be dominated by white people should like or trust them. It is our prerogative, as the native people of Hawaii, to decide whether if at all, we should extend our trust and friendship to any haole. I closed my statement by suggesting that if Mr. Carter did not like Hawaii, our language, or our ways of doing things, he could leave, since Hawaiians would certainly benefit from one less haole in our homeland. My article was published on September 19, 1990. Five days later, on September 24th, 
Larry Loudon, chair of the philosophy department, and himself a recently arrived Hale in Hawaii, wrote a letter to the vice president for academic affairs, Paul Yuan, demanding my public reprimand for voicing such views and arguing that I was an administrator and therefore a spokesperson for the university. His request was followed by a philosophy department resolution called a, quote, statement on racism in academia, end quote, alleging that my public reply to Carter was, quote, racist, end quote, condoned, quote, violence against a member of the university community solely because of his social identity and opinions, end quote, and consequently betrayed a, quote, most basic professional responsibility, end quote, which they defined as a, quote, special duty to protect and sustain the fragile atmosphere within which ideas can be assessed on their merits, end quote. Specifically, the philosophy department alleged that my invitation to Carter to leave Hawaii was similar to a white professor declaring black students unwelcome and proposing they return to Africa. This resolution was sent by Loudon to Yuan on October 15, 1990, requesting that I be removed from my position as director of the Center for Hawaiian Studies, which they alleged was a position of administrative authority. This resolution was distributed widely to the press by Larry Loudon and others, and was answered by President Albert J. Simone on November 2, 1990. Simone assured his good friend, quote, Larry, end quote, that, quote, administrators may not speak for the University of Hawaii without appropriate consultation with senior officers of the university, end quote. The president ended his letter by saying that his administration does not condone creating an, quote, unfriendly, intimidating, and non-supportive environment for faculty and students, end quote. On November 3, 1990, the Faculty Union of the University of Hawaii reaffirmed academic freedom at the university, quote, for the expression of all points of view regarding the racial issues recently raised on the Manoa campus, end quote, and endorsing fair and open debate about race, colonialism, and any other related issues in Hawaii. The union went on to reaffirm its position that chairs and directors are not administrators, but faculty included in the collective bargaining unit, and as such, are free to speak their minds without fear of sanction by the university administration. On November 8, 1990, President Simone announced his intention to conduct an investigation into my statements, thus violating all semblance of confidentiality, something he prizes for white men. Simone told the Honolulu Advertiser, 9 November 1990, by phone from Japan that he believed I was an administrator and that administrators must accept, quote, the principle that some things are better off not said publicly, end quote. I think it is clear that Simone had made up his mind by this point. My public statements were not protected by academic freedom of free speech. While Simone conducted his investigation, the faculty senate began their own triggered by the same philosophy department resolution. For the first time in its history, the Senate, another white male bastion, decided to investigate a fellow faculty member for written public statements. Without precedent and procedures, the Senate moved ahead on the basis of the philosophy department resolution alone. Thus, by the middle of November, a quote, witch hunt, end quote, had begun in earnest, and the white male, quote, boys club, end quote, was hysterical with venom. Indeed, white men led the charge, with people like Gary Fuller of the Geography Department comparing me to Hitler and Saddam Hussein, and Dick Miller of the William S. Richardson School of Law telling the faculty senate that my thinking was similar to that which led to the rise of Nazi Germany and resulted in the internment of Japanese Americans. Ken Kipnis of the Philosophy Department, meanwhile, told one of my faculty supporters that the Hawaiian movement was like the Ku Klux Klan, and that I would have to decide whether I wanted to be a professor or a member of the movement. Charges of impending violence against white people surfaced everywhere, with the most virulent being made by Larry Loudon himself, proclaiming that I was giving, quote, hunting licenses, end quote, to my students and other Hawaiians to beat up Haole. This is the same Larry Loudon who told KHON News that my, quote, brand of radicalism, end quote, did not belong in a university, while attacking a rally in my defense as a form of, quote, terrorism, end quote, on campus. Despite my numerous calls and those of my supporters, 
for Loudon and others who disagreed with me to come forward and debate the issues, I was charged and condemned in the media and in the faculty senate as a racist. The phenomenon known as McCarthyism, where individuals are accused falsely and never given an opportunity to confront or disprove their accusers, began to characterize the campus atmosphere. Hate calls and mail began to surface in the Hawaiian Studies Office. Kaleo ran a poll asking if students thought I was a racist, and stickers began to appear on campus, attacking me personally and raising the specter of violence by white supremacist groups. Meanwhile, the faculty senate proceeded, as did President Simone, both determined to condemn me without once speaking with me. Indeed, most of my accusers had never read or thought seriously about my statement. They were content to read the philosophy department summary or the ellipses in the Honolulu dailies. The implication seemed to be that white men do not lie, so why read what the native said? Just trust the interpretation of her statements by knowledgeable white men. And of course, this is where the problem began. The philosophy department, like Joey Carter, is ignorant of the scholarly and novelistic studies and portrayals of racism. Thinking that racism is a matter of color and not of history and power, the philosophy department intentionally misread my statements, which Larry Loudon then viciously recast, saying I was justifying violence against Carter. However, I never justified violence against Carter, only our rights as native and oppressed people to feel hostility toward the Haole. Just as Palestinians are justified in their hostility towards Israelis, just as Jews are justified in their hostility toward Germans, just as the Northern Irish are justified in their hostility toward the British, just as all exploited peoples are justified in feeling hostile and resentful towards those who exploit them, so we Hawaiians are justified in such feelings towards the Haole. This is the legacy of racism, of colonialism. I explained the long history of white violence against people of color precisely to educate Joey Carter about his place in history. For it is white people, and not people of color, who have a history of violence against others. In Hawaii, it is the Haole who took our land, took our government, destroyed our nationhood, and suppressed our culture. It is white people who created laws to divide Hawaiians by blood quantum. It is white people who created institutions foreign to our ways of life. It is white people who brought capitalism to Hawaii. In other words, it is white people who, for their own benefit, have exploited and oppressed Hawaiians. Carter, like most white people, did not know or want to learn any of this. But if I did not argue for violence against Haole, then why did the philosophy department and their vicious chairman say that I did? The answer, I believe, lies in the fears and resentments of the Haole themselves. Here in Hawaii, Haole have grown accustomed to the myth of racial harmony created and reinforced by the politicians and the tourist industry. Haole live in predominantly white or Asian neighborhoods, and if they know anything at all about Hawaiians, is that we have a funny, unpronounceable language, we appear on television as activists or other lawbreakers trying to stop development, and we have a deep wound, called the overthrow, when the all-white American government took our sovereignty. Yes, Haole and Hawaii are nervous because they know wrongs were committed in their names and for their benefit. So, when an uppity native woman educates one of their own about his white history and his obligations to natives, their fears and anger spill over into crazy accusations that, if examined, reflect back on their own sick history of violence. As Franz Fanon has taught us, dark skin and dark people are the classic boogeyman of the Haole. White people know that all over the world, people of color have been brutally and unjustly treated by white imperialism. White people know how violent they have been to each other and to us, and they know our grievances are real and thus they imagine how much more violent we would be to them, with our real history of violations. This is why every demand for respect and recognition of dignity on our part is read as a sign of violence. This is why white people so fear black people in the United States, despite the fact that it is white people who have a history of violence against black people, and not the other way around. 
White violence, then, has a long and sick history. In the world, in the Americas, in the Pacific, and right here in Hawaii. And this continues to be denied. The denial is evident in the philosophy department resolution. For white male power and white racism are alive and well here on this campus. Where else but a colony would a native woman be investigated by three committees for exercising her right as a native and a citizen to publicly criticize a white man? Where else but in a colony would white administrators talk babble about, quote, responsible, end quote, speech? Do they mean the, quote, responsible, end quote, speech of Larry Loudon defending certain forms of sexual harassment in a student publication called Voices? Or the, quote, responsible, end quote, speech of Ian Reed, another white man and faculty member, arguing the mental inferiority of women in the same student magazine? Or the, quote, responsible, end quote, speech of Dick Miller, accusing me of creating an atmosphere similar to the one that led to Nazi Germany and the internment of the Japanese? Or the, quote, responsible, end quote, speech of Ken Kipnis, comparing the Hawaiian movement to the KKK, when our movement has never been violent? Is this speech, quote, responsible, end quote, because it was spoken by white men in support of continued white male power? Indeed, in the long history of Hawaii, it is white people who have killed Hawaiians, beat Filipinos and Japanese on the plantations, and lynched and shot workers and denied them decent wages. It is white people who wanted statehood and who continue to deny us sovereignty. It is white people who continue to live on stolen Hawaiian land and thereby benefit from our dispossession. Thus, quote, responsible, end quote, speech, as it is defined by white men, creates the parameters of academic freedom. White men can say all manner of dangerous, violent, and false things, and tell absolute lies, in fact, like the lies of Miller, Kipnis, Loudon, and the rest, and their speech is acceptable. But when an articulate native woman speaks the truth about the haole, she must be reprimanded, removed, and shut up. No academic freedom for her, nor free speech either, because by definition, dissenting speech, speech that criticizes and opposes the prevailing system of colonial domination, cannot be, quote, responsible, end quote. Why? Because such speech is dangerous. It is the voice of political analysis and of a critical, alternative intellectual tradition. In my specific case, what I wrote about in my newspaper article was the truth, the unalloyed, ugly truth about Haole power in the United States and in Hawaii. This truth has anchored a great tradition of resistance created by Black and American Indian and Palestinian and Asian and Pacific Islander peoples. Further, this tradition is unknown and untaught by most Haole in this university, which means by nearly 80% of the faculty. Native people do have a claim to feel hostility toward their oppressors, and Hawaiians would benefit from one less Haole in Hawaii. In fact, we would benefit from thousands less, beginning with the military. Indeed, native people all over the world would benefit if their colonizers went home. So we come to the last McCarthy-like accusation by the philosophy department. I am guilty of racial harassment because my public statement created a, quote, climate of intimidation for Joey Carter, end quote. First, let us be clear about what Joey Carter did. He wrote a public statement in a public forum stating a position for which he alone is responsible. Part of that responsibility is that he must answer for his argument and for the reactions it provokes, both favorable and unfavorable, just as I am responsible for my public statements. But when Carter received unfavorable responses from myself and others, he chose to blame his personal misfortunes on me and then to run away from the controversy. This, in itself, is irresponsible. In other words, Carter wanted to dish out nasty remarks, but he did not want to be responsible for them. Let us pursue the question of a, quote, climate, end quote, of racial intimidation. How did I intimidate Carter when I have never met, seen, or spoken with him? Indeed, to my knowledge, I have never even been near him. 
am I, then, one of those primitive natives with all sorts of, quote, black magic, end quote, at my disposal, who conjures up climate systems, say, rain or snow, or in this case, racial intimidation, at the scribble of my pen? Apparently I am. Or so think Larry Loudon, Ken Kipnis, Dick Miller, and a host of other white men. To discover whether I created a, quote, climate of intimidation, end quote, Tom Getting, the university's dean of students, investigated Joey Carter's allegations against me. After several months of inquiry, he released his report. The following is a direct quote from Dean Gething's findings. Quote, I have found no evidence that Dr. Trask, who has never met or spoken with Mr. Carter, discriminated against him in regard to his race or color. I have found considerable evidence that a hostile environment in regard to race or color exists at the University of Hawaii Manoa. This condition existed prior to Mr. Carter's column and Dr. Trask's response. It is clear, moreover, that the existence of this hostile environment was brought to the attention of the community and was highlighted by the two columns in the ensuing events. However, I have been unable to determine a cause and effect relationship between either Mr. Carter or Dr. Trask and the existence of this condition. End quote. Dean Gething says nothing in his report about the racist historical antecedents of this quote, hostile environment. End quote. I have suggested that they are to be found, for anyone interested in searching them out, in the colonization of Hawaii. A hostile climate does exist at the University of Hawaii and the best evidence of it lies strewn all over the campus in hate flyers calling for the physical dismemberment of an Asian woman who was an anti-war protester and a supporter of mine, describing a black student from Nigeria who had the courage to support me as a quote, n-word, end quote, and a quote, dumb black boy, end quote, and calling me a quote, dominating lesbian sex offender, end quote. But these are only flyers, you say. Well then, let us turn to white men in their classes, such as Mark Merlin of the Department of General Science, whom my students have complained about to the administration because he teaches that the royal insignia of our lii, called Le Palaoa, are made out of female pubic hair. Or let us take Gary Fuller, who compared me to Hitler, and whom my students also complained about because he says Hawaiian language is dead and not worth learning. Or a number of political science and history professors who say that Hawaiians practiced infanticide when no credible evidence exists that we did. Or all the snide, off-the-cuff remarks that tell Hawaiian students their culture is primitive, undeveloped, or inauthentic. Does this create a hostile racial environment? Is this a form of racial intimidation? Or is this just history, white colonial history, that no one, not the philosophy department, not the administration, and certainly not the white press, is about to protest, or investigate, or condemn? Yes, there certainly is a hostile environment on this campus, an environment that is similar to colonial environments in occupied countries all over the world, an environment that is native-hating, that keeps power in the hands of the colonizers, and that attacks any dissenting voice, any political alternative. Intimidation on this campus is enforced by white racist ideology that praises and reproduces white racist culture and ensures the dominance of white faculty, white administrators, and white curriculum. This situation constitutes, quote, intimidation, end quote, and worse. This situation constitutes racism, the racism of white men with access to power, of Larry Loudon and the philosophy department, of certain members of the faculty senate, and of President Al Simone and his administration, the racism of members of one racially identified group, the Haole, who oppress and subordinate another racially identified group, Hawaiians and other people of color, for the benefit of the exploiting group. For who benefits if Hawaiians are degraded, if they are kept to a small population on campus, if one of their number is publicly investigated and removed? Who benefits? White power benefits, and white men benefit. Hawaiians, of course, lose. They lose a voice. They lose a fighter they lose a place where defiance is taught and encouraged. And all of us lose the richness of critical ideas, cultures, and people. Academic freedom, then, 
the freedom to learn, to teach, to argue, and above all to dissent, is determined by white men. If they do not like what you say, they will try to shut you up by punitive actions and public vilification. Let me just end by way of an update. All three investigations triggered by my column have been concluded in my favor. Nothing I did was worthy of reprimand or removal. But the message of all this investigating is simply this. If, in a public forum, faculty members of color exercise the right to argue a position that is contrary to, and critical of, white ideology, they will be investigated. Moves by white faculty or white students against people of color will be protected, however. The fact that President Al Simone has said to the Honolulu Star Bulletin that publishing flyers calling for the physical dismemberment of an Asian woman who is an anti-war protester is the same as my supporters holding a rally and my Hawaiian Studies program publishing a newsletter reveals that the president has lost all sense of proportion. In particular, the Nazi-like quality of the flyer against Mari Matsuoka, calling for her, quote, sterilization, end quote, and the, quote, fumigation, end quote, of this, quote, vermin, end quote, from the campus is shocking. The combination of super-patriotic militaristic ideology in the flyer, with this call for physical harm against Mari, is a clear sign of the vicious intent of these racists. How President Simone can compare this to public statements in support of my position, although dissenting from his own, is remarkable. It seems that the president cannot distinguish between signed public disagreements, that is in opposition to white ideology and anonymous death threats. Even the police consider such threats to be criminal and a violation of state law. But we have a president who thinks such behavior is only, quote, deplorable, end quote, and not criminal, and who thinks that dissent equals physical harm. To me, this state of affairs proves what I have been saying, as a Hawaiian and as an intellectual, all along. White men protect white men. This university protects white hegemony. If any of you had doubts about this, the latest response from President Simone equating public dissent with death threats proves my point. I am certain the president would not think the same about death threats to white men. Please think about the comparisons I have drawn. When dark people are treated with less dignity than white people, that is, when Hawaiians and Asians and other people of color suffer racism, and when threats against their safety are considered unimportant, indeed frivolous, we are living in dangerous times. Postscript The controversy was actually more physically threatening than I explained in my speech. I received five hours of taped hate calls, including death threats, at my home. My Hawaiian female students received rape threats from white male students. My staff of the Center for Hawaiian Studies received threatening phone calls at work, and an assistant professor and I were physically threatened by a white man, age 56, at my office. Although most of this was known to the president and his staff, none of it was considered as dangerous as my letter to the student paper. It is obvious that in Hawaii, where Hawaiians fill up the prisons, harassing and threatening us is keeping the peace. But criticizing white men is perceived as a danger to the entire social order. Native Student Organizing The Case at the University of Hawaii Like most native programs in American universities, Hawaiian Studies was founded only after a long struggle, which included endless lobbying of two university administrations and of three state legislative sessions for funding. We had to contend with a lawsuit designed to stop our Hawaiian Studies building and with hostile white faculty on the campus who thought, predictably, that natives should not have five acres to themselves to teach about their culture and people. Hawaiian Studies, both in theory and in reality, became a site of engagement. This locus of struggle generated enormous public attention and thereby attracted more Hawaiians to our campus and to our center. Like many such programs on the American continent, Hawaiian Studies was born of intense resistance. For ten years prior to our establishment in 1987, 
Hawaiians throughout our archipelago were engaged in struggles for the land. These included efforts to stop military misuse of our lands, to protect our lush, natural environment, including wetlands, coastal regions, and agricultural lands, and to prevent urbanization. Eventually, land struggles became part of the push for Hawaiian sovereignty. Given that the United States had invaded Hawaii in 1893, overthrown our queen, Liliuokalani, and put in her place an all-white sugar planter oligarchy, Hawaiians organized to reconstitute our government. Today, some 20 years since the beginning of the sovereignty movement, we are still fighting for re-establishment of our native nation, the return of 2 million acres of native lands, and inclusion in the federal policy on native self-determination in the United States. Hawaiian studies is part of the larger Hawaiian sovereignty movement. We are part of the struggle for native control over native lands and native communities. We represent Hawaiians in resistance at the University of Hawaii, and we are consciously focused on training cadres for the nationalist front of our movement. My students come into our center, then, partly because we are engaged in the study of our culture and history, but also because we are native nationalists. For students, as for any other organic group, organizing occurs at the site of engagement. The campus, where students study, live, and work, is the primary site of their resistance. This is not to say that students do not participate in community efforts, but the main arena of student resistance is the campus. It has to be, since that is where the forces of power penetrate and construct student lives. Given the campus focus, then, one of the first targets for student engagement is usually the multiple centers of control over student life. Good examples here include the administration of universities, that is, various offices of the president or chancellor, student services, even, at times, the board of regents. These are power centers where policy is made and unmade. Another arena is student government where the fiction of student empowerment is often invoked to mask the unequal power relationship between students and administration. At the University of Hawaii, student government for many years was nothing more than a training ground for state politics. Rarely did student government officers represent students. They were usually too busy serving the interests of the university's central administration, making contacts for later use when they would move on to lucrative positions in the state legislature or county government. But if past individuals use student government only as a stepping stone to electoral politics outside the university, student government, as a political entity itself, is always a potential critical site of resistance. Because the institution of student government commands resources, such as student fees, a physical space, and support staff, it is ripe for takeover by progressive forces. Additionally, university administrators, board of regents, and the press also assume the authority of student government to represent students, thus conveying legitimacy. As a legally created, recognized voice, student government can be captured by progressive forces, just as state governments can be captured by revolutionaries. Other ready-made campus arenas can also be taken over by progressive forces. For example, official student newspapers, student housing or co-ops, sports facilities, even parking structures. Potential sites of engagement are where students predominate, even if they have no well-defined roles in those institutions or structures, and even if, as students, they do not fully comprehend their own potential. After all, contrary organizing exists precisely to increase consciousness of radical potential. To say, however, that these areas are sites of engagement does not imply that only campus concerns shape student issues. Far from it. When I was an undergraduate and graduate student at the University of Wisconsin from the late 1960s through the mid-70s, the Vietnam War focused a great deal of organizing and protests. The Black Civil Rights Movement came also to define our resistance, as did one of its offshoots, the fight for a Black Studies now African American, studies program. We were so vocal as students that the governor of the state of Wisconsin called in several thousand troops to, quote, maintain order, end quote, as he put it. In truth, 
The naked power of the state was forced into the open by unruly, protesting youth at the university. Predictably, the very presence of engagement, or political resistance, challenges the ideological and actual power of the state to maintain order. The value of resistance inheres in the challenge to authority. Unmasking state or other institutional power is part of the value of resistance. When governors call out the military to quell civil disturbances on campus or off, the hidden fist of state authority, that is, military power, is made obvious and tangible. Exposing state power and its mechanisms is, in itself, a public good. Indeed, it is a revolutionary good. The lines between liberatory practices and oppressive practices are drawn much more clearly when power is exposed. For example, the struggle over affirmative action, when taken into public spaces, forces the state into conflict with its insurgent citizens. This conflict goes some distance in revealing the extent and nature of state power. Put another way, citizens come to understand the constraints that entangle and disable them when they organize to change the very institutions that possess power over their daily lives. On campuses, the continuous struggle for affirmative action draws out the racism of a state system of education, and beyond that, the racism of American ideology and politics in general. Without such a challenge, the absence of people of color on campuses is naturalized, is made to seem representative of the existing order of things. The presence of so many white people, or, in the Hawaiian case, so many non-natives, on our campuses is made to appear as a kind of Darwinian natural selection, instead of the intended result of entrenched systems of class and race and settler discrimination. The challenge of Hawaiian studies, indeed our very presence, and my particular relationship to the powers that be, generated so much resistance on the part of the administration and some faculty departments that we were under siege for nearly a decade. First, in 1991, the university tried to remove me as director of Hawaiian studies because I wrote a letter to the campus newspaper chiding a white male student for publicly complaining about our word for white people, that is, haole. I said, rather simply, that if he did not like the word or our language and heritage, including our homeland of Hawaii, then he could leave our beautiful islands, since we would certainly benefit from one less haole in Hawaii. That letter generated a firestorm of protest including calls for my removal by the faculty senate, the university president, and a few haole male departments like the philosophy department and the law school. For the active Hawaiian studies students, however, this incident precipitated a historical movement for organizing. Forming themselves as Maka Epono, the student group took on the university student newspaper, which ran a series of racist cartoons and polls targeting me, Hawaiians in general, and the students in Hawaiian studies. Maka Epono was so active that they became, for a time, the focus of political protest by right-wing students and organizations on campus. But as a result of their involvement in defending me, Maka Epono students experienced a heightened consciousness regarding the oppression of Hawaiians on campus. Soon, they began to see that student government, as well as the student newspaper, had a certain amount of visibility and power. Alleged, quote, student institutions, end quote, controlled budgets, offices, telephones, and, perhaps most critically, they possessed a certain status. To speak as a student senator, or better, as student body president, meant that status accrued to the position and thereby to the person who occupied it. Learning quickly, Maka Epono organized to field candidates for office. They did not have a slate, but they had a decolonizing consciousness. Although only a few students were elected as senators, Hawaiians realizing that capturing student government would only be a matter of time. Moreover, their experience sent a message to other Native students that organizing could bring power. Subsequent student groups, such as Kui Kalahiki, set their goals at running candidates for each general election. They also became a voice for other arenas of resistance, such as the use and correct spelling of the Hawaiian language. They argued for the hiring of a civil rights counselor in student services, partly to relieve the burden carried by Hawaiian studies 
but also as an acknowledgement that student civil rights were under assault and needed an officer outside the faculty to help in protecting students. Through their efforts, the general campus awareness regarding Hawaiians, racism against us, and campus hostility continued to increase. This consciousness, like that of the general public, was also increased by the larger sovereignty movement in the archipelago. In one sense, organizing around sovereignty in the political realm spilled over into the university. Hawaiian studies was led by faculty who actively supported sovereignty and were enrolled citizens of the largest sovereignty organization, Kalahui Hawaii. Public political commentary was offered by the faculty on all Hawaiian matters, from indigenous burials to anti-eviction struggles, gathering rights, and, of course, sovereignty. Undoubtedly, our students followed the example of their kumu, or, quote, teachers, end quote. They committed themselves to engagement in the native issues of the day. But on another level, our students chose their own path. Their issues reflected their own concerns, and the ground upon which those issues were enacted was the classroom, student government, and the university administration. The sites of student engagement, then, illustrate the concerns of the students more than their teachers. That is, as it should be. Our current student group, Ka Lai Po, followed in the footsteps of the trailblazers before them. They, too, resisted racism on the campus. In their case, their group was formed when two sisters, one eight months pregnant, were removed from their, quote, geography of Hawaii, end quote, class, because they challenged the Haole professor about his racist misrepresentations of Hawaiian history. They were escorted out of class by four campus security guards. The charge was that their questioning disturbed the class, preventing the teacher from continuing. In fact, they disturbed the professor's lies about Hawaiians committing infanticide, demanding that he provide historical evidence to substantiate his claim. He had them removed on no other grounds than that he did not like their criticism of his racist history. The fact that the sisters were indigenous Hawaiians is central to the case. They had learned that the allegation of Hawaiian infanticide in traditional times was a missionary fabrication when they took my required Hawaiian studies class on, quote, myths of Hawaiian history, end quote. Here, we can see how the teachings of native history becomes a political project. Decolonizing native minds produces a volatile political atmosphere. Of course, the history of Haole does not generate resistance among Haole because their history is taught in a celebratory way. Whatever resistance develops in such courses tends to be from individual students. But teaching people of color the prevailing American racist histories of people of color, especially the, quote, savage, end quote, native or, quote, genetically inferior, end quote, African American, often generates insurgency by students of color. In this way does the teaching of our history become a much contested arena, one that presents students with an invigorating moment to decolonize their minds. Resistance, in the case of the sisters, led, in turn, to the birth of a Hawaiian student group called Ka Lai Po. At the forefront of campus activity, Ka Lai Po publicly protested the sisters' eviction from class by holding rallies, challenging the racist professor on his evidence, and demanding a civil rights counselor from the administration. As part of their opposition, the group decided to make capturing student government a priority. They contested all positions. When the votes were counted, a Hawaiian woman had won the presidency by four votes, while the rest of the slate had captured the majority of the Senate seats. Once in office, the Kalai Po students refused to hold an inaugural ball, saving substantial monies for student programs. Because they had organized themselves the summer before classes began, they came to the campus in the fall prepared to do business. They put elections online, challenged the university's president to include them on the governor's economic revitalization task force, and constantly issued press releases on every concern they felt to be critical. For example, they lobbied the Board of Regents for tuition waivers for Hawaiians. They also took on the effort to rename the Social Sciences Building, which, like most campus buildings at the University of Hawaii, is named in honor of a racist, 
one Stanley D. Porteous. In the case of Ka Lai Po, we have a successful example of student organizing by an insurgent, oppressed group. First, they coalesced around a significant issue, one that erupted on campus and concerned the racist depictions of Native people. Second, they demonstrated publicly at rallies, held forums, and called press conferences. Third, they named themselves in their own language, choosing a name with symbolic meaning. And finally, they decided they would seek student government by running a slate calling for student rights. As the native Hawaiian slate, they fronted their indigenous status in their effort to capture power. Once elected, they rapidly made connections with other ethnic groups and organized their platform accordingly. In fact, Ka Lai Po is now part of a Polynesian slate for next year's student government. The Hawaiian students have made a common link with the Samoan students to form an alliance of Polynesians. For me, personally, Ka Lai Po and its victories have been long in coming. After two previous student attempts to capture campus government, Ka Lai Po finally attained the presidency. Given that Hawaiians comprise less than 5% of a student body of over 40,000 full and part-time students, their success was substantial, indeed phenomenal. Ka Lai Po's victory illustrated the value of organizing at the most basic, in the trenches level. It sent a message that the Hawaiian sovereignty movement had taken up residency on the campus. As in the state, Hawaiians were asserting their claim to self-government, but this time, the arena was the campus and the government was student government. I am also pleased to say that the leadership of Kalai Po has been predominantly female. The Associated Students of the University of Hawaii, ASUH President Mamo Kim, is female and, not inconsequentially, 47 years old. Most of the ASUH senators are female. Most of the hardcore organizing has been accomplished by women. And obviously, and obviously, the major advisor to Ka Lai Po is female, namely myself. Is this accidental? I do not believe so. Women are at the forefront of our sovereignty movement. Women lead our Hawaiian Studies Center. Women represent most of our leadership and established organizations. In brief, women are on the front lines, the battle lines. There are historical and cultural reasons for this, but the history is not as important as the reality. The reality is simply that women are there, where the action is, where the people live, where the nation resides. We are ready to take risks, to dig in for the long haul, to be present and counted. Not only counted as numbers, but counted upon, responsible, enduring. This was true of the 1960s Black Civil Rights Movement in the South. Then, women and young people led the organizing efforts. The same is true for our sovereignty movement today. And the same is true for our campus organizing. Women lead, and, in our movement, they have been the finest leaders. Our students have made alliances with Samoan students, with some Haole, or quote, white, end quote, students, even with the few African-American students on campus who are engaged in student government. To me, our woman's leadership is really quite natural. That is to say, our woman's leadership is everywhere, in every field, in every category. The same is true, now, of campus leadership. The presence of our woman is partly explained by our sovereignty movement, but it is also explained by our amazing individual and cultural strength. As Hawaiians, we expect leadership among our women. I expect it of myself. This is the way of our people.